Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect. I just want to make sure that everybody had uh, signed in before I admitted everyone. So I think we're all here. So we're all set. Um, are you all ready to do some math today? <laughs> You're like, hey, I don't know. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, we're going to start with the math today. Um, just to review a little bit from the last time, um, let me share my screen. So I can kind of go over again uh, where to find everything at just real quick and then we'll get into the math. Okay. Um, sure. So for the homework assignments that are connected to the sections that we'll cover, you can click on this um, My Math Lab homework. And then the one we're going to start today is our point four. We won't be able to finish all of it within this first hour. But when we do finish it, then you can go ahead and complete the rest of that assignment, okay? You could start it today, but we won't have all of the information for the whole assignment just yet. Um, and then if you wanted to print notes beforehand, um, you could, if you click on the My Notes, you would click on R, I think it's chapter R for reviewing, um, load in a new window first. And then you would do chapter R. I prefer the PDF only because the document, um, you could make edits to it. And if you did, it might alter it a little bit on accident. So the PDF, you can't really mess that one up. It's just, it's static. Um, so I would suggest looking at the PDF. And then if you wanna print, only print the section or the pages that you're going to need. So for now, we're only doing R.4. And I think that was like page 25 to page 20, 31. Um, so, that was just a recap of where to find the stuff. So when I switch over to my paper, you're going to see what I downloaded from that my notes um, PDF file. Okay. And then I did place in this page here, if you notice at the bottom where it says week one class recordings. So I put that in there after the last class. And that is where you will find the link to the first um, lecture that we had which was more of like an orientation, right? We didn't do any math or anything that day. Um, and so you do see the video here. You'll see me, you'll see my screen, all of that good stuff. So the same thing as today, um, once we start doing all of this, make sure you pin my video so that you can see my paper large on your screen and not all of the little different uh, cameras, okay? Um, and it does help me if I see your cameras. If you're real, real shy and you honestly, I, I really need you to come off of mute though, for sure, if you have questions, okay? Definitely, definitely interrupt me if you have questions along the way, okay? So let's see. I will also place underneath this one. If you happen to miss class and you're watching the recording, if you do have any comments or questions, you can type them in here and then I can respond to you, okay? Or if you just happen to have a question that you thought of afterward, if you comment it within the particular lecture, I'll be able to uh, respond to your question, okay? You could also text me, right? We had you sign up for the remind text the last class. So that's the fastest way to get a hold of me, just because it goes straight to my cell phone. So if you do have questions as you're working on homework problems, I highly recommend you text them to me, just because you'll get a faster response that way, okay? Um, but let's go ahead and get into our notes for today. So if you did print them out, um, let me, there it goes. If you did print them out, then they would be blank, okay? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that you knew what to be filling in the blanks with. So at the beginning of this, this is just a recap on factoring. Hopefully, if you took the math 0, 4, 10 class, you would have gotten to a little bit of factory, maybe not all of it, but you would have seen a little bit of it. Um, and I know some of you have had some experience either in the class before this one or in high school, because there's already a few people that have taken off in the um, homework. So I have a few people that have already completed like four or five homework assignments and we have not gotten there at all yet. But if you're ahead of me, that is totally okay. Um, I do not mind working ahead. Uh, if you do come up with problems that are causing issues for you, just make sure you bring those up when we talk about those in class, okay? 
if you're not texting me directly. Does anybody have any questions before I start? No? Okay. Then for factoring, it's basically the process of finding um, polynomials. Now, normally in our case, there will be two binomials. So it's like something with two terms and then something with two terms. That when you multiply them, that's what product means, it equals another kind of polynomial. Okay. So essentially what you start off with is a longer one. And then you want to figure out, well, what things did I multiply together to get this big polynomial? Okay. That is in a sense, the process of factoring. Okay. Now, if for some reason you have a big long polynomial and you cannot find two factors that would multiply out to give you that polynomial, then that polynomial is called prime. Okay, so it's essentially a polynomial that cannot be factored at all. And then you know that a polynomial is factored, quote unquote, completely if every single product, every single thing that you got that would multiply to give you the big one, if each one of these guys cannot be factored anymore. Okay, so that's how you know that it's completely factored. So for the first just the intro examples is basically how to factor out a greatest common factor. So you're trying to find something, now remember what factor is. Factor means that it multiplies to give you what you have, okay? So you wanna take out the greatest thing that they have in common, and then whatever's inside of these parentheses should have the same number of terms as you have originally. So if you notice, I here have two terms. So once I figure out what my GCF is, we'll talk about that, I should still have two terms inside this parentheses, okay? That's essentially what this is letting me know, okay? And I wrote some little comments on here, if you notice, right? They kind of give you an idea of where you're gonna see these similar problems. So like this problem is very similar to number one in the homework, okay? Um, this problem down here, is like number three in the homework. And then this number that I added in um, is like number two on the homework, okay? So I'm trying to give you ones that are pretty similar to what you'll see. So you're not completely lost when you're trying to do the assignment, okay? Um, now here, does anybody know what the common factor would be for uh, A? You can come off mute and just shout it out. It might help if I expand them. So if I think of nine, the number, what are two numbers that multiply to give you nine? Three. Mm -hmm. Three times what? Three. Three again, right? And these two guys are what are considered prime numbers. So that's back in arithmetic, right? But just to recap, prime numbers would be two, Three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, so on and so forth. And as long as these are prime numbers, then I know I've broken it down into its quote unquote primes. So nine y to the fifth can be written as three times three, and then five y's multiplied together, right? That's the definition of an exponent. And y squared can be written down as y times y. Now, I will not do this every single time. This is just to kind of get us moving along, okay? Now, what does this term and this term have in common? Why? Mm -hmm. They do have a Y in common, but is that all that they have in common is just a single Y? They have two Ys at least. They do, exactly. They have two Ys in common. And we don't have to write y times y, we can write y squared instead, right? So then what we're going to do is if we wanna figure out what's supposed to go in this parentheses, this is what's happening mentally, okay? It's, I don't write this down every single time later, but this is what's happening mentally. What you're doing is you're taking the originals and you're dividing them by that common factor. 
So whatever you put out there is what I'm going to divide by on each term. Okay. And then what happens is you reduce it. So if I'm reducing this one, it's like saying nine divided by an invisible one, nine divided by an invisible one is just nine. Now here's some exponent rule recaps. Does anybody know what you do with the exponents when you're dividing? Subtract. Subtract. So when I do the top exponent minus the bottom exponent, I'm actually gonna get a three exponent. Now here's a little bit trickier. What happens here? Turns into a one. It does. Any number, I don't know what this number is, and I really don't need to know, because whatever it is, if I divide it by itself, any number divided by itself would be one, right? Four people split up into four groups would be one person in each group, right? Two people split up in two groups would be one person in each of those two groups. So it's always going to be one when it's the same number. I want to get away from people saying canceling. Because if you cancel it, chances are you're not going to write anything in here. And remember we said the parentheses should have the same number of terms inside those parentheses as you had in the original. So if you were to quote unquote cancel, this would like go away and then you wouldn't have the two people inside the parentheses. Okay. So that would be a misunderstanding. Be careful not to quote unquote cancel, but actually like reduce or simplify. Okay. So this is division and any number divided by itself is that one. You could check your answer, right? If you distribute and you multiply this times this, does that give you your first term? And if I do this times the one, do I get that second term? If it works out, then this is the correct factorization. Okay. Part B is same directions. We're factoring out the common factor, but here I have three terms. So then how many terms should I have inside my parentheses once I take out that common factor? Three. Three terms, exactly. So what do they have in common here? Is there a number that I could divide all of these by evenly? Two. Yeah. Now, is there any letters in common? T. T. What about X? Uh, only two of them have X. Correct. So we couldn't take X out of all of them, okay? But once I've identified what they do have in common, I'm gonna put that outside the parentheses. And then I'm gonna do just like I did before. I'm gonna write it out this time, one last time. And then after that, I'm just gonna do it in my mind, okay? It's, they call it mental math, right? So the two T stays outside, that was the whole goal, right? And then what would I get when I reduce that first fraction? Three X squared. Mm-hmm. These t's would reduce, right? Six divided by two is three, and I still have that x squared there. Now, what about here? Four x. Mm -hmm. These would also reduce. It would really reduce to like a one, but if I multiply this times one, doesn't it stay the same? Yeah. Right? And then here, what do we get? Six. Mm -hmm. And again, when this reduces, it'd be a one, but six times that one is still just six. And then you can always check, just distribute and see if after you multiply these, if you get the same three original terms. So six times, or two times three would be six. I have the X squared and the T, right? Two times two is the eight. I have the X and the T. Here, two times six is 12, and I have the T, okay? So that one does check out. And I apologize for those of you who are super awesome at factoring already. <laughs> Maybe you learned it in high school or you learned it in a previous class. Just bear with us. 
okay? I wanna make sure that we're all on the same uh, level before we keep going, okay? Now C is a little tricky if you've never seen it done before, but what sticks out that is in common in all three terms? And what is really weird is to even figure out how many terms you have. Does anybody know how many terms are here? You could take a guess and it's okay if it's wrong. Three. There are three. So notice here that I'm underlined the three terms. Notice that all this stuff was multiplied together and then it's separated by a plus or a minus, right? And then all this junk is multiplied together and then it's separated with the plus or minus. And then all of this stuff is multiplied together. Well, because of these parentheses, this entire thing is actually multiplied by the 14, which makes this whole thing just one term, okay? And then again, this thing is being multiplied by the 28, so it makes this all one term. And then this parentheses is multiplied by that seven, so it makes that whole thing one term. So you're right, there are three terms. So I know that once I figure out what my GCF is, I'm gonna have that on the outside and I'm gonna have it at the bottom, right? But I should have three terms inside my parentheses. And I'm definitely gonna need more room than that. So let me erase what I've written. Now here's the weird part. What do they have in common? They're all dividable by seven. Yes, that is true. So I could definitely factor out a seven. Is there anything else that they have in common? They have an M. More than that, they have an M plus one, right? So I don't know what M is, but I know that once you add one to it, that number, they all have in common, right? So this thing they have in common. Here's the question though. How many of them do they all have? So this one has a cube, which means there's actually three of these factors. This one has a square, which actually means there's two of those factors. So, so. And this one doesn't have an exponent, which means there's just that one factor, okay? So if this one's got three of those factors, that one has two, and this one only has one, they only have at most just one in common, right? Similar to what happened up here. Even though the y's, there were five of them in this term, this one only had two, so I could only take out the two they had in common, right? And that's the same thing here. Even though this one has three and that one has two, the last one only has one, so I can only take at most just one of them out. So now that we've identified what our greatest common factor is, we'll put that on the outside. And then here's the long annoying part. This is the mental part but it does help us at the beginning to write it down while we're learning it out, okay? Eventually you might be able to learn to skip this step. If you never wanna skip this step just because you like to be consistent, that is perfectly okay with me. I mentioned in the last class, the more steps you write, the better, right? I don't require everyone to write every single step, especially all the mental steps, but to everybody, everybody has their own way of doing things, okay? So you do what works for you. My only heed or warning is that if you don't write any steps and then the question gets marked wrong, I won't be able to give you partial credit if I don't have anything to see, okay? So you'd wanna try to write something down. Even if all you're doing is writing down from here to here, I can usually figure out what happened with just these short, smaller problems, but we will get to some more lengthy problems. Okay, so here's the thing. How does this simplify, right? 14 divided by seven would be two. And what do we do with these exponents again? When we're dividing? Subtract. We subtract. Now, how many of them are down here though? One. Just one. 
So I'm going to write like a little one here just so that I know that it's one and that guy has one as well. So then if I'm doing three, take away one, that's going to leave me with two left over. I'm going to bring my minus sign down. 28 divided by seven is four. And then two, take away one is one. Now we don't write the one when we're writing our final answer, just like they didn't write the one when they wrote it originally, right? And then what is seven divided by seven? One. One. And then this divided by this is also one because it's the same thing divided by itself. But what's one times that one? One. Just the still gonna be a one. And as weird as that looks, just leave that alone. Don't worry about messing around with it too much more. Because all they said was factor out the GCF, and we did that. Okay. It didn't say um, factor completely, right? So we don't have to worry about messing around with this part just yet. Okay. Last one. I'm going to kind of try to draw a line here because I don't want to get mixed up. Now, this one is a little bit tricky because there's something that I haven't mentioned when it pertains to greatest common factors, okay? For greatest common factors, if for some reason your first term is a negative, you have to factor out that negative. You do not have a choice. If you noticed here, my first term was positive, positive, and positive. So none of my GCFs were ever negative. They were always positive, okay? But on this problem, you'll notice that the number in front is a negative, right? So because the front number is negative, I do have to factor out that negative, okay? Then from there, I can decide what they all have in common. So is there a number that both terms could be divided by? Three. Mm hmm And then are there any letters? The, does anybody know the fancy word for letters? Variable? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I can stop saying letters. <laughs> I can start saying variables, okay? So do they have any variables in common? P. P. They don't have, they both don't have Qs, right? Now, how many Ps though? One just one. This one has a cube, but this one doesn't have anything. So it's just a one. So all I can factor out is just the one. Now I don't write the one. I always use my red pen because it's like invisible and I'm just trying to make it visible, right? So let's go ahead and work that out. Put that GCF on the outside of the parentheses. And then we're going to divide each term by that GCF. So this one's gonna be a little bit more challenging only because it has signs involved now, right? Because the bottom has a negative. So be careful. What is negative three divided by negative three? One. A positive one. Now I'm gonna make it invisible for, I'll just put it there. I'll clean it up later, okay? We also know that these guys have little invisible ones. So three take away one is gonna give me a two. Here's a tricky part. This plus sign belongs to that 12. So what's positive 12 divided by negative three? Negative four. Yep. And if you have your calculator already, you can type those in there. Okay, you can type in 12 divided by negative three and it will tell you it's negative four. If it were positive four, I would have to write plus four to get my second term, right? Here, these guys would reduce giving me a one, but one times this four is gonna keep it still a four. And this Q squared doesn't have anybody to reduce with, so it's just gonna come down. So this one, that number in front is called a coefficient. And when your coefficient is a one, you don't ever write it. 
It's kind of like when they when I had done y squared, right? There is a coefficient there. It's an invisible one. Okay. But you never write the one coefficient, just like you never write the one exponent. Now, this could be factored more. For some of you that are already fantastic at factoring, you might recognize that that could be factored more. But our directions only said to factor out the greatest common factor. The directions did not say to factor completely. So we are going to stop on this problem, okay? We may or may not be able to address how that's gonna factor more today, but we will for sure get to it by the next class period, okay? Does anybody have any questions about example one in all the four parts so far? I have something in the chat. Oh, somebody was answering one of the questions earlier. Sorry, I didn't see it in the chat, but you were correct. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on to the second kind of factoring. It really is an extension of the first kind of factoring. So we'll kind of get some more practice with it. Um, but, it is slightly different, okay? Um, for example two, these are the problems that say factor by grouping, okay? Now, factor by grouping only works when there's an even number of terms, more than two. So if there's like four terms or six terms or eight terms, um, but in this class, we'll never see more than four, okay? so. Just note to self, right? If you see four terms, then you know um, that you need to be factoring by grouping, okay? And the way you factor by grouping is to quote unquote group the terms together. That's why you need an even number so that you can make two even groups, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically split the problem in half, and then we're going to do exactly what we did on the first example problems, on each group, okay? Now, the question is, is when I wanna split this in half, like I see these two terms and I see those two terms and I wanna cut it in the middle between the 7m and the 3p squared. The issue is, is where do I draw my line? Do I put it um, behind the m? Do I put it behind the plus? That's the big, you know, where, what do, how to, I, how do I do that, okay? Um, needs to actually go behind the second term because this plus sign tells me the sign of that number, okay? So that sign goes with this number. So you don't wanna separate them by drawing a line in between. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw the line after the second term. And now we have kind of grouped the problem, right? We have two separate groups. I apologize, but my camera just, this is different than the camera in my office. The camera in my office doesn't keep autofocusing like this, but this one does. So every time I put my hand in and take my hand out, it, it does like little adjustments. So I apologize if that's making your eyes go a little wonky. Just bear with me. So let's go back to the last page. What do these two guys have in common? Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Brandon, I'm so sorry. You're the one that like speed raced through all the assignments. So you're just kind of being our, our navigator here. But anyone yeah, else can uh, type in. Yeah. Yeah, they were uh, in the chat as well. The chat. So. Awesome. Awesome. Let me keep my chat open then. There we go. Thank you, Naya and Catherine. Yes, you're right. These guys have M. So now I'm going to do the shortcut. Okay. I'm not going to do the long way anymore. So. This is how I do the shortcut with the grouping. Instead of writing these guys again and then putting M at the bottom, I kind of cheat a little bit. Oh, it's not focused. Let me give it a second. There it goes. What I do is I divide them by M here, just so I don't have to rewrite anything, okay? And so then these Ms will reduce and I'll just have the P squared 
these m's will reduce and I'll just have the seven, right? Now, one more quick tidbit about grouping. So we know one rule is that we have to chop it in half after the second term. The other big rule is, is whatever this sign is, it must come down. You do not have a choice in what sign goes after that, that uh, splitting line, okay? It has to be that sign right after the splitting line. So mine in this case is plus. Now, what do the two terms to the right of the line have in common? Any factors that they have in common? Three. Yes, thank you. Quantrone also said three, so great, thank you. Come on, Zoom. <laughs> it's taking a second. <clears throat> okay. So then what I'm going to do is I know I'm going to have to have two terms, right? Because there's two terms here. I have to have two terms there. But since this is a positive three, I'm going to say I'm going to divide that by positive three, and I'm going to divide this by positive three. Well, positive three divided by positive three is a positive one. So I'm just going to have positive one p squared. But remember, I never write that positive one coefficient, okay? Then positive 21 divided by positive three is a positive seven. Now what we do is kind of we take a step back and we look at it now. Imagine that the red line is not there on this step. Notice that these are multiplied, so this makes one term, and these are multiplied, which makes a second term. What do these two terms have in common? This one might be easier to say than it is to type. <laughs> yeah, uh, P squared and plus seven. Right, that whole bubble, right? I call them bubble, but it's parentheses. Yeah. You'll hear me say bubble a lot. Um, yeah, they do have a P squared in common, but this is not just P squared. This is P squared plus seven which makes a difference because if I know, let's say for instance, I know that P is five, right? This then P squared would be five squared, which is 25. But M is not being multiplied by a 25. It's being multiplied by a 25 plus seven, right? Which is actually 32. So you have to be very careful because these go together inside that whole bubble, okay? So it's actually the whole bubble they have in common. So I'm gonna take out that, that whole bubble. And since I had two terms beforehand, I should have two terms inside this new bubble or new set of parentheses. Now, remember, if I were to take this and divide by the bubble, wouldn't the bubble reduce, right? So all I would have left is the M. And here, if I were to divide by the bubble, the bubbles would reduce and I would just have the three. So it's kind of like you're grabbing it from both of these and you're just putting it out in the front as one, okay? Now, we did officially turn it into a product, right? We had a long polynomial and we turned it into something times something else. So we have successfully factored this, okay? Now, I do always have a lot of people asking me, did I do it right? There is a way for you to know whether or not you did it right, okay? And it's gonna come in handy, especially like when you're taking the test, right? Because if you wanna know if you got it right or not before you move on to the next problem, this is one of those kinds of problems where you can check it yourself, okay? So I'm gonna actually check it over here on the side. I won't check all of them just for time constraints, right? But I'll check this first one just to make sure. Okay, so if I take P squared plus seven and I take M plus three, I have to multiply this out. Now I'm not sure how much everybody remembers about um, multiplying polynomials. So I'm gonna go over it just a little bit, okay? Cause we'll, we'll be doing it a lot throughout the semester. So it's good to refresh it. So what we do essentially is we just take every single one of the terms in the first parentheses and we make sure we multiply it by that second parentheses. So when I rewrite this, I'm gonna take the P squared and I'm gonna multiply it by M plus three. 
Then I'm gonna take that positive seven and I'm gonna multiply it by n plus three. So what I do is I take this p squared and I distribute it. I'm gonna circle it. And then here, I'm gonna take the positive seven and I'm gonna distribute it. So for here, p squared times m is just p squared m. p squared times three, normally we like the numbers in the front, right? So three p squared. Um, positive seven times m would be positive seven m. And positive seven times positive three would be positive 21. Now, notice I have a positive 21 term, right? So that one's good. I have a positive 7m term, which I have here. I have a positive 3p squared term here. And then I have an mp squared. This is actually, oops, let me let it focus. This is actually the preferred way to write it. Whenever you're writing multiple variables uh, multiplied together, they usually like them in alphabetical order. So m in the alphabet comes before p squared, doesn't it? So this is the more formal way to write that term. Now, this is not wrong, and I would definitely never mark this wrong, but this is the more formal way to write it, okay? Which is why they wrote it that way. But it does match, doesn't it? So this term is correct as well, okay? And so then like you just you, know, sure. Okay, I like how you broke it up into like two steps um, because before, like when I would try to, um, uh, like, is it called foil? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, it's not, not a yeah most people do foil and, 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 it, and, and it works, but it does, you have to keep track of like what you're multiplying and all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it, it, it's fine. It, it's doable, I think, in my opinion, when you have two times two, but then when you get like two times three of them or three of them times three of them, that foil method can get really crazy. So yeah, I prefer this. Again, you're not required to do it that way. I'm glad you like it. Um, but this is just the way I do it because it makes sense for all the multiplication of polynomials. Yeah, You'll I much prefer the way you you did it or like you show, guys, I've never, I've never been told like that before. And oh, so, good. Yeah. Well, now you know, right? <laughs> awesome. Um, yes, no, you'll notice throughout the semester, I really, math is like, it's the reason why math is confusing is because there's multiple ways to do the same thing, okay? And the thing with the instructors is we love math so much and we think that it's so much fun that there's all these ways to do things. But when you're learning, I don't think that it's beneficial to show you all the ways to do stuff. I think if we just show you one way that works predominantly for all the situations, you're better off with that than me showing you, hey, this works and this works and that works and that works. <laughs> because then people start to meld all of the different methods together and start creating their own methods that don't work, okay? Um, so I really try to do things that I know are gonna work um, no matter what the situation is, okay? So if I'm multiplying polynomials, this will be the way that I multiply polynomials, okay? Um, that's just my own teaching philosophy. Not all the teachers agree. Some teachers think that I should show you every single way there is, and then you pick the one you like. But I promise you, in my experience, people get them all confused. <laughs> so I just try to narrow it down to one way and then go with that. But when I grade, I never force people to do it my way. So if you have learned other methods in your previous classes and they're working and you're getting all the problems right, then by all means, keep doing it whatever way you were taught, okay? I do understand even the foreign methods. I've had some students from other countries doing it completely different ways and it worked and I could understand how it was working on their papers. So by all means, do it the way you do it. If whatever you're doing is not working for every single problem, then stop it. <laughs> Revert back to the way I'm showing you, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, let's go ahead and try the next one. Now, the next one is a little bit weird because I'm gonna do this split in pencil. 
if I try to split this right here, do these guys have anything in common? No. Nah. They don't, right? And then these guys don't have anything in common. I mean, I, I'm going to end up having to forcibly take out that negative, right? But as far as the factors of the terms are concerned, they still don't have anything in common. So if they don't have anything in common, I won't be able to take anything out, which means what's in these parentheses won't be the same because it'll be that same thing, okay? And so then they won't have anything in common ultimately for me to take out again. But the instructions say for me to factor this by grouping. So it should be factorable by grouping. The issue is, is that I have to rearrange these terms. So if you notice that happened to you, where they don't have anything in common, the two things, then move them around, okay? Now, there's, I don't, don't like to move the first one. I usually like to keep the first one exactly where it is. So you have some choices, because there's three other terms, right, to move. Which one do you think I should write next? The <clears throat> negative a y squared. And why did you pick that one? Because it has uh, y squared with the two y squared. Yeah, because they both have y squared. That's a good observation. Would anybody have picked negative 2z because they both have twos? No? No, I, I would have. <laughs> yeah, you would have? Some people would. And I'm going to write them both just so that we can see what we have. Okay. So I'm gonna go with not the one that you picked, Brandon. And then I'm gonna go next with the one you suggested. And I'm just leaving the rest of them alone, but we'll talk about those in a minute, okay? Now, if I did it this way, okay, I would cut it in half. And then what do these two guys have in common? The two the two and then that's actually all they have in common so if i took the two out i would be left with y squared minus two is out and i'm left with a z i have to bring down this plus sign i don't have a choice but these two guys obviously have an a in common right so when i take out a well positive divided by a positive will still be positive but if the a has come out then all i have is z and here, if the a has come out, all I have is y squared, and a negative divided by a positive is still negative, okay? Mm -hmm. If you have to write positive a, positive a, that's okay too, right? I did say that was a mental step, but if you visually need to see it, please go ahead and write it, okay? Now, notice what's in the parentheses is not exactly the same, is it, right? We both have z and y squared, but here y squared is positive and z is negative, and here it's the reverse. The y squared is negative and the z is positive. So these are not exactly the same. So putting them in this order actually didn't work, okay, in order for me to continue factoring it. Because those bubbles or those parentheses should have exactly the same thing inside in order for me to do the next step. Now over here though, if I cut this after the second term, these guys have y squared in common, which means that came out, I have a two y squared came out, all I have is the minus a. And over here, I'm forced to bring out that plus sign. And then they have a z in common, which means I have an a, positive a, and then a negative divided by a positive is negative, z came out and I have a two. Isn't it the same exact situation, right? We have a two and an A inside that bubble, both of the bubbles, but the signs are different on both of those bubbles, okay? What that means is that this was not um, the correct order in which to do them. Now, that doesn't mean that these choices were wrong. What it means is, is that if you made these choices, you have to think further about the other two terms, okay? So we'll go with the one that Brendan had said just at first. We'll go with this. 
Okay, oops, a y squared, right? So if we were to take this term first and then this term second, that leaves us with these two terms. Now we already tried to put a z and then minus two z. So by process of elimination, you would swap them around, right? But why would I swap them around? The reasoning is, is because notice that you have a two and an a in the front and you would want them in that same order a two in the front and then an A in the front, okay? So I'm gonna write the minus two Z and then the plus a Z. So there is a problem like this, number four, in the homework. You will probably have to play around with how to reorder it in order to get it to work, okay? These were my failed attempts, so I'm gonna kind of border them off. So now I'm gonna use my pen because now I know I have them in the right order. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off at the second term. And then like Brandon said, we have y squared in common, which if that comes out, I have the two left. If that y squared comes out, I still have the minus a. So that one with the y squared, I didn't feel the need to put the y squared at the bottom, right? And then reduce the fractions. It, it wasn't necessary. This next one though, I will do it because I do find it necessary when I have a minus, okay? These two guys do obviously have a Z in common, but notice that I'm taking out a negative Z, right? So when I go over here, let me find another color. I'm actually gonna put negative Z and negative Z. And I know I write my Z's weird, I apologize. I just, my twos sometimes look like Z's. So I try to keep them separated by writing that little line in the middle. Okay. Um, so here though, a negative divided by a negative would actually be positive, right? And the Z's would reduce. So I would just have the two. But here, a positive divided by a negative is actually a negative. And the z's would again reduce, leaving me with just the a. But notice now, the two parentheses, the two bubbles, they match now, right? So what they have in common will come out to the front. And then I always say like what's left will go in the second parentheses. So if this came out, what's left is the y squared. And again, if that's what came out, then what's left is the minus Z. Uh, how come it was minus Z instead of like? Whatever this symbol is must come down. So oh, notice okay. up here was a plus and it must come down. But good question, yes. I've done that with these two, but these were not good orders, right? Maybe I should put it in red, right? So it stands out because that is a rule. You have to cut it off after the second term and you have to bring down um, that second sign. Those are just two things we don't have a choice with, okay? It's part of the process. But thank you for asking. Okay, now I'm not going to check it. If you want, you can check it. You can do the same thing I did up there where you do two times these guys, and then you do negative A times these guys and see if you get all four of these terms. They may not be in the right order, but they should all still be there with the right signs and the right letters and everything, okay? Okay, this one, I didn't see it in the um, homework section. The homework section had like different letters like these, but this one honestly is more of the kind that you'll see when we get to our um, like algebraic equations that we have to solve later and stuff like that. We would just see one variable, not usually two variables or three variables, okay? So I definitely wanted to include one that just had nothing but X's, okay? So here, I actually don't need to reorder it at all because I don't have all of those letters and things trying to to go with it, okay? 
So this one, we're just gonna jump right into it and chop it in half. And what does the left side have in common? X. It does have X, but how many can I take out from each term? X Over squared. Mm -hmm. X squared. What about the numbers? Two. Ah, yes, both four and two can be divided by two. So it'll be the number two and an X squared. Now here, that's pretty complicated. So I think I will put it underneath. And I'm glad I did. Because remember, we have to have two terms inside here, right? So four divided by two is two. And then what do I get when I do X cubed divided by X squared? X. Mm -hmm. This is X with the power one, right? But we yeah. don't write the one. Good. Now, what do I get for the second term? One. Mm -hmm. Two divided by two, or actually anything divided by itself, right, is one. Now, what do I have to write next? What sign? Negative. Yes, remember this one has to come down, right? And what does the second half have in common? Negative. Negative mm -hmm. one. They have nothing in common, right? When they don't have anything in common, you're right, you use one because you can always divide anything by one, right? So when it doesn't have anything in common, we are going to use a one. And so I'm gonna write that no GCF. This symbol means implies, okay? So it's like an arrow, but with two arms. So no GCF implies that the GCF equals one. So that symbol means implies. So you'll see me, you may see me use that symbol later. It just means this means that, okay? So we're gonna use one. Well, then I'm gonna divide each of these by a negative one. So a negative two divided by a negative one is positive two and the X is still hanging out. And then negative one divided by negative one is actually positive one. And now that I'm done doing the GCF bits on both sides, now we're gonna take a step back and do the GCF of the whole thing. So you've got this one giant term because it's multiplied together and this one giant term because these are multiplied together. And the two giant terms have that bubble 2x plus one in common. So if I take the 2x plus one out to the front of the parentheses, all I'm gonna have left, if that came out, all I'm gonna have left is 2x squared. And if that came out as well, all I'm gonna have left is the minus one. So remember the two bubbles come out, but as one. Does anybody have any questions so far on factoring by grouping? And do take some practice, especially number four is gonna be weird because you might have to try it different ways, okay? So look out for number four on the homework. And I can't say it enough, I'll probably say it every single class period, <laughs> but if you do get stuck on certain problems when doing the homework, just be sure to text me, okay? You can take a picture of whatever you're doing on your computer, and then just say, and then take a picture. If you've already tried it, take a picture of whatever you've tried. Because you, you'll learn more if you try it and then I correct where it went wrong 
than if I just tell you how to do it, okay? So definitely, definitely always try and then I'll help. Okay, the next section that we're gonna go to is factoring trinomials. But this one is, this one can be the longest process, okay? So this one definitely has a long process. Now there are multiple ways to factor in trinomials. Some people learn the guess and check. Some people learn like a reverse FOIL method. Um, and then there's another method that, I, that works for every single trinomial, which like I told you, I only like to show you the one method that I know is gonna work. <laughs> um, and so I'm, that's the one that I'm gonna concentrate on, okay? And the method that works for factoring any trinomial is called the AC method. Now we may or not, may or may not be able to actually get to it, but I at least want to explain it. I know we don't have too, too much time. What is it, like 115? Um, so we don't have too, too much time. Hopefully maybe we can get through one example, but we will definitely finish this one um, and I'd rather just show it to you so that you can kind of wrap your mind around it and then we can practice with it later, okay? So essentially what you do is you have a trinomial and they look something like this. They may not look exactly like this. You might have different variables and this guy might have a variable. But what's important to pay attention to is the coefficients. So the coefficient in the first term is labeled as A. The coefficient of the second term, the number in front, is labeled as B. And then the coefficient of the third term, if there happens to be variables, is labeled as C, okay? And so in the AC method, what they're doing is they're multiplying A times C. And that's what I have here. And since you multiplied those, you need to figure out what two numbers multiply to give you that value. And it may or may not be those two numbers exactly, or it may be a different combination of numbers. And I'll show you an example in a little bit, okay? But whatever it is, those same two factors have to be factors that combine to give me B. Now, I don't wanna say add to give me B because when you start involving positives and negatives, just because there's a plus in the middle doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be adding, right? It depends on what the signs are. If the signs are the same, then yeah, you're combining them together and you're making more. So if I'm, if I'm adding two positives, yes, I'm gonna combine them and have more positives. If I'm combining two negatives, it'll be more negatives. However, if you're combining a positive number and a negative number, you don't actually um, add those digits. You actually subtract the digits and then keep the sign of the larger number. So I really try to stay away from saying the word add but actually combine, okay? Now the idea is, <coughs> excuse me. So the idea is here, if I were to have done that, um, I tried to do the FOIL here, but if I do two X times three X minus four plus one times three X minus four, <coughs> excuse me and I distribute, I don't know what happened, something happened and my throat got dry. Give me one second, I'm gonna get some water real quick. So there we go. Um, if I distribute these two, I would get that 6x squared, right? If I distribute this to the 4, 2x times negative 4 will give me a negative 8x. If I distribute this positive 1 to 3x, I will get a positive 3x. And if I distribute the positive 1 to negative 4, I will get a negative 4. So 
key numbers here in the middle are actually the numbers that work in the AC method. So look at the original. <laughs> I do apologize. I don't know what got in my throat, but it's making me cough. Okay. So if I were to take A times C, that is actually negative 24. <clears throat> And if I were to take B, B is actually a negative five here in the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. The goal was to figure out what two numbers multiply to give me this negative 24, but add to give me this negative five. And if you notice, these two numbers here in front of the X, negative eight and positive three. <clears throat> they do just that, don't they work out, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Negative eight times positive three is this negative 24. And negative eight plus positive three, they're different signs. So I actually subtract the numbers to give me five but I keep the larger number sign, which is a negative five, okay? So these numbers, negative eight and positive three are the magic numbers that I would have to find if I were using this AC method, okay? So you won't be given this. What you'll be given is this trinomial, and then you'll know that I have to come up with numbers that give me negative 24, and I have to come up with numbers that equal negative five. But how do I figure out that it's negative eight and positive three? That's the hard part, okay? How do I get those specific two numbers that work, okay? Now, the list of things that multiply to give you negative 24 is far shorter than the list of things that give you negative five. Because I could take 100 plus negative 105, 100 plus negative 105, and I will get negative 5, won't I? I could take negative 3 plus negative 2 and get negative 5. There are an infinite number of possibilities to combine two numbers together and get negative five, an infinite number of them, right? How in the world would I know which two are gonna work, right? If there's an infinite number of possibilities. So trying to figure this guy out first is not the way to go, okay? What you wanna do is find the multiple factors first that give you negative 24, because that list is far shorter. There are only a certain number of numbers that multiply to give you 24, okay? And the way we do it is we take 24 and we find all of its factors. If you don't know what all the factors are of 24, I'm gonna show you the way to make sure that you get them all, okay? What you do is you type in your calculator, square root of 24. And I don't care what you get after the decimal. The decimal is irrelevant. What I care about is what you get in front of the decimal. So when you type in the square root of 24 in your calculator, what do you get? Even if you have a phone on you, <laughs> your phone should be able to calculate that if you don't have your actual calculator with you. It was like 4.8. Mm -hmm. You're right. It doesn't matter the decimal part. That number in front of the point is what I needed. Okay, so good. Um, what that tells me is that when I'm doing this list, I'm only going to go up to four. Okay. Now, it might seem silly for a small number like 24, especially if you memorize your timetables, but these numbers are not always going to be tiny numbers like 24. You might end up with like, I don't know, 196. And that's not intuitive for us, 
okay? And so this is the process that works for all numbers. Now, if I were to type in my calculator 24 divided by one, it would tell me 24. If I typed in 24 divided by two, it would tell me 12. 24 divided by three, it would tell me eight. 24 divided by four, and it would tell me six. It just happened to be that all of these numbers actually do divide into 24, okay? But because I use this, I know that this is absolutely all the combinations. That means there's four combinations. That is far less than an infinite number of combinations, right? So we don't wanna look at this one, bottom one first. We wanna look at the top one first. Now, here's the thing. My product, when I multiply them, needs to be a negative. What that tells me is that one of the numbers is gonna be positive and one of them is going to be negative. However, when I combine them, somehow I need to end up with a negative, which also tells me that the bigger number has to be negative. So I'll say that again, because it's a lot of information, okay? When the product has to be a negative, the only way I can get that is a positive times a negative, okay? But when you combine them and you end up with a negative, this means that the larger number is the negative. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, isn't this column larger than the values in this column? So what that tells me is that I'm gonna make all of these guys negative. And then because I need a positive and a negative, that means these guys are going to be positive. And if I try to combine that, what is one, plus a negative 24. Negative 23. Mm-hmm. And what is two plus a negative 12? Negative 10. Negative 10. And three plus a negative eight. Negative five. Now, I wouldn't have to do that if I already found my negative five, right? But I'm gonna do it anyway. So this is the one that gave me the number we were looking for, right? So these are the numbers that worked. And that is how you find them, okay? So let's see, I, hopefully we have like five minutes left, but let's see if we can get in five minutes one problem done. Not all of them, but let's see if we can just get one. Oh, well, we got lucky. It's 24 again. <laughs> so if I apply this AC method, let's start from the beginning. I would have to do A times C, positive four times positive six. So that gives me a positive 24. And then B is a negative 11. So something plus something else to give me negative 11. Remember, we're focusing on this guy first. This one we'll figure out later. So 24 first. All the factors of 24. Luckily, we just did it. But just to recap on the process, you take the square root, you get that digit before the decimal, and that's how far down the line you have to go. Then you just divide the number at the top by each one of these guys individually. Okay, so 24 divided by one is 24. 24 divided by two is 12. 24 divided by three is eight. 24 divided by four is six. Now, if you're not great with your multiplication, that might take just a tiny bit longer because you have to jot it in the calculator, right? But it's still totally doable if you're not fantastic at multiplication, okay? Then this is the hard part. This is the sign part that, that's a little tricky, okay? In order for me to get a plus when I multiply, it means both of my numbers needed to be positive or- and Both of them need to be negative. Right, both of them need to be negative, right? Because those would both multiply to give you a positive number. But what does this one tell you? It's a negative. Yeah, 
there's no way I can add two positives together and then get a negative 11, right? So they're gonna have to be two negatives. So then that tells me that both of my columns are negative. Now, without me having to rewrite everything, imagine that these little dots are plus signs. What is negative one plus negative 24? Is it negative 11? That's the question. No, it's no. negative 25. Right. Is negative two plus negative 12? It's negative, negative 14. 11. Correct. What about this pair? Negative 11. That one is the negative 11. So now I have my two numbers. It's negative three and negative eight. You don't have to write them in here, but I do just to confirm. So if I multiply those, do I get positive 24? I do, so I'm good. And if I add those, do I get negative 11? And I do. So I found, I call them the magic numbers. So I found the magic numbers. What we're gonna do with these magic numbers is we're gonna split this middle term using those magic numbers. Now that middle term has a Y. So that means each of my numbers, my magic numbers are also gonna have a Y. So I'm gonna keep the four Y squared. Then I'm gonna write the first magic number with the same variable. The next magic number again with the same variable. Because if I combine those like terms, I should be getting this, right? This line and this line should be equivalent. But now how many terms do I have? No. I have four now, right? Four, I yeah. have one, two, three, four terms now. And we just talked about how to factor things that had four terms. In Those, groups. Right, we're gonna group it. So these two guys have a Y in common, which gives me four, but an extra Y. And this Y came out, so I just have the three. I have to bring down my minus sign. And these two guys can both be divided by two, but they don't both have letters. So I can't take out any letters. Oops, let me let it focus. So if I divide this by negative two, I'm gonna get a positive four with the Y. If I divide this by negative two, I'm actually gonna get a negative, negative three and they match. Oops, it went out of focus again. So I'm gonna take out the bubble they have in common. And if those bubbles came out as one, all I'm left with is the Y minus the two. And so we have successfully factored it, okay? It is a long process. It does take practice. And I don't, by any means, we have lots of them to practice. <laughs> so we'll get to that in the next class for sure. But at least kind of let your brain process it a little bit until I see you again, okay? And then when we come back, we'll keep working with more of them. Does anybody have any questions about this one before we go? No. Okay. We saw one sign variation, right? Negative, positive. We'll eventually get to negative, negative, positive, negative, and all the different um, combinations that you would see, okay? So if you're iffy on sign, we'll, we'll get to them, all the combinations, okay? But other than that, you guys, if you, you come up with anything, you have any questions later, just text me. I'm here to help. And I hope you guys have a good, actually it's Thursday, right? So you have a good weekend, okay? I hope to see you all in class on Tuesday. But for now, you guys are dismissed. Have a good one. Bye. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.